My pleasure. We appreciate that. Thank you. Please have a seat. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for having us. Happy to do it today. Before you decided to join the CIA, can you describe the, the zeitgeist of this time and uh, what inspired you at that time? It's easier for me to tell you what inspired me. Really, it was my grandfather. I come from an immigrant family. Mm -hmm. uh, my grandparents, all four of my grandparents, came from the Greek island of Rhodes and uh, arrived here in the early 1930s. My grandfather, my father's father, to hear him tell the story, you know, Franklin Roosevelt was personally waiting for him at Ellis Island to give him citizenship and a job and a future. And, um, and so he was very, very patriotic uh, and very solidly democratic. He was a, a huge Roosevelt supporter. Uh, we even had a picture, a framed picture of Franklin Roosevelt on our television until the day he died. And so he always, he always instilled in me this notion that the country was so good to us when we needed a helping hand that we needed to give something back. Mm -hmm. And so when I was in college, I really only considered public service. I didn't consider anything else, business or private companies, nothing only public service. The Zeitgeist at the time, it's funny that you ask, I, you know, all the interviews I've given, and I've given thousands of interviews, nobody's ever asked me that before. Oh. Um, you know, I, I'm almost a little bit ashamed to tell you that, that I sort of bought into the whole neoliberal, oh. um, you know, American exceptionalism, USA number one, when I was in college. We were picking off little countries like Grenada and Panama and I, I don't know, it just seemed like we were a force for good. Jimmy Carter had started the annual Human Rights Report in 1977 and so I thought maybe I'll join the Foreign Service. I'll go to the State Department, see the world and I really wanted to travel and see the world. And then in graduate school I had a professor who wasn't really a professor. He was, he was a CIA officer mm -hmm. undercover as a professor. Mm -hmm. And he was looking for people who might fit into the CIA's culture. He liked my writing style. And so he asked me if I wanted to be in the CIA. I said yes, and I was in. Uh -huh. uh, could you summarize your experience in the counterterrorism at the CIA? Sure. I joined the CIA's counterterrorism uh, center in 1998, specializing in something that's it's quaint now. Uh, it was uh, Greek uh, communist terrorism, mm -hmm. which, believe it or not, was actually a problem for us back in the day. Uh -huh. uh, but I spoke Arabic, and my, my bachelor's degree was in Middle Eastern studies. I had a specialty in Islamic theology. Mm -hmm. I spoke Arabic fluently, um, but I also speak Greek fluently, and as it turned out, they were looking for someone who spoke either Greek or Arabic. As it turned out, I was the only person in the entire CIA who spoke both Greek and Arabic. And so they put me in counterterrorism. Uh, I did two years in Athens working, not just against Greek groups, which no longer exist, but against the likes of Abu Nidal and the uh, Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, the Libyan Intelligence mm -hmm. Service, the Iraqi Intelligence Service, things like that. Tell me, how did the Soviet Union's existence inform the focus and priorities of the CIA during this period? On my very first day yeah. at the CIA, all the new hires go into what's called the bubble. It's, yeah. it's a large auditorium yeah. just outside the old headquarters building. And uh, you get a briefing by the director and the deputy director and the head of security and the head of medical, the head of finance. Everybody comes to just tell you what they do and what to expect in your CIA career. And I will never forget the director of security. He was a, he was a tough old man at least in my memory, he was old. Um, and uh, he looked at us, all of us young, we were all in our early 20s, and he says, the greatest threat facing the United States today is the threat of Soviet communism. Well, this was January 1990. The, the Berlin Wall had just come down three weeks earlier. And I remember thinking, wow, I can't believe I'm going to work against Soviet communism. 
Because for you, it was this kind of a James Bond thing. It, that's exactly what it yeah. was. It was a James Bond kind of thing. Yeah. Um, now, of course, that turned out to be ridiculous, and he was living in the past. Yeah. Uh, what it ended up becoming was a fight against global uh, proliferation, mostly of nuclear weapons, but also of chemical and radiological, uh, bi biological weapons. Um, but he, even he didn't realize that the world had changed because it had just changed like three yeah. weeks earlier. So um, in the end, uh, my assignment was to work on Iraq, uh, which I complained about because nothing ever happened in Iraq, ever. It was the same, it was the same cabinet since 1968. Mm -hmm. We would go sometimes an entire day without receiving a single report on Iraq from anywhere in the world. And so I complained. I said, listen, I'm, I'm sitting here like, you know, playing with myself all day long. I, I got to do something else. And my boss said, you're brand new. Just learn the writing mm -hmm. style, learn what we do, and then we'll put you on something more interesting like Romania, he said. And I thought, oh, okay, Romania is interesting. They just killed Ceausescu and, you know, well, Nine months later, just as I start to feel like I know what I'm talking about, Iraq invades Kuwait. And one of the senior analysts pulled me aside and said, I don't think you realize the importance of what just happened. He said, it's not unusual for countries that we cover to go to war with each other. Mm. It's very unusual for countries that we cover to go to war with us. And so the very next day, I was sitting in the Oval Office with the President, the Vice President, the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the National Security Advisor, and the Director of the CIA. And the President said, so tell me what I need to know. And everybody turns and looks at me. I was 24 years old. Uh. And I thought, oh, if my friends could see this, they wouldn't even believe it. Mm -hmm. But I realized, no, this is... I like this. Yeah, yeah. This is fun. This is going to work for me. And so for the next um, eight years, it was all Iraq all the time. Right. Would you say that you were a bit naive before? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, I was very, very naive. Yeah. Not just when I joined the CIA, but through most you of my CIA point. career, yeah. I was very naive. Right. You know, in the 1990s, when Bill Clinton became president, he ordered the CIA to do something called a cull, C-U-L-L. -L. Mm -hmm. And what he meant was he wanted the CIA to go through literally every one of its files. And if any recruited source had a problem in his background with human rights, he was to be fired. And the CIA actually fired about a third of their sources all around the world. And I remember thinking, wow, they're really serious about human rights. This is great because, I'm sorry, this is great because that was always an issue that was important to me. Um, and that only lasted until September 11th, yeah, 2001. Yeah. So that, maybe that's the, the perfect moment to talk about Patriot Act. Mm -hmm. um, so 9-11 arrived and maybe like a month after They, mm -hmm. It was uh, a month. So, so did that, tell me that was planned in advance, <laughs> not 9-11 thing. No. I, I don't know about Actually, that. Actually, it wasn't planned in advance. And you know how you can tell? It was so badly written. It was so oh, yeah. broadly written yeah. that individuals all across the country had to begin filing lawsuits uh -huh. on the grounds that it was unconstitutionally broad. Okay. So what they did, and it, they did the same thing at the CIA. They just said, we'll ask for everything and we'll let the courts decide what we can't have. Well, the courts decided that they could actually have everything. Everything. You want NSA to spy on Americans? Done. You want NSA to intercept every text message, every phone call, every email of everybody in the United States and hold it for 500 years? Done. Here's an extra $10 billion to build the new facilities that you're going to need. Mm -hmm. You want to spy on American peace groups? Go ahead, do it. Infiltrate them. The FBI now is all over the place. Um, literally anything that the intelligence community or, inter or, or national uh, federal law enforcement wanted, they got it. And every once in a while, thanks to Ed Snowden who revealed this to us, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. every once in a while there, there will be a debate in Congress. But so far the Patriot Act has not been weakened. No. It's, it's renewed year after year after year. Don't forget that 9-11 was 18 years ago. 
So for 18 years, we've been trying to get our September 10th country back, mm -hmm. and we've failed. John, now I know that you've been talking about that a lot, but I'd love to know how you ended up in prison. Yes. So in the immediate aftermath of the 9-11 attacks, I was named uh, chief of CIA counterterrorism operations in Pakistan. Big job, as you might imagine. I had been there for um, not long, uh, slightly less than two months, and we got word that Abu Zubaydah was somewhere in Pakistan. We believed at the time that Abu Zubaydah was the number three in Al Qaeda. And so we sought out to track him. And it took us six weeks, but we found him. And we did, we launched a series of raids, 14 simultaneous raids on 14 separate sites, uh, one night at two o'clock in the morning, and we caught him. So to make a very long story very short, when I returned to CIA headquarters later in the spring, um, I was asked if I wanted to be um, certified in the use of enhanced interrogation techniques. I had never heard that term before. This was mid-May 2002. So I said, what does that mean, enhanced interrogation techniques? And this coworker who had asked me became very animated. And he said, we're gonna start getting rough with these guys. I said, well, what does that mean? And so he described these 10 techniques. I said, that sounds like a torture program. He said, no, it's not torture. We got approval from the Justice Department and the president said we could do it. And I said, I don't know. I think I have a, a moral problem with this. Give me an hour to think about it. So I went and I sought the, the advice of a senior officer, a very senior officer, for whom I had worked in the Middle East about a decade earlier. I said, what do you think of this, this enhanced interrogation? They just asked me if I wanted to be trained in it. And he said, look, let's call a spade a spade. This is a torture program. They can call it whatever they want. They can use whatever euphemism they want. This is a torture program. And torture is a slippery slope. And you know how these guys are. Somebody's gonna go overboard and they're gonna kill a prisoner. And when that happens, there's gonna be a congressional investigation and then there's gonna be a Justice Department investigation and somebody's gonna go to prison. Do you wanna go to prison? I said, no, I don't wanna go to prison. It turned out I was the only person who went to prison. But I said, no, I don't wanna go to prison. I went back downstairs. I said, this is a torture program and I don't want any part of it. And then, that was May, and then on the 1st of August, 2002, they began torturing Abu Zubaydah and other prisoners. Um, in the end, they actually murdered two prisoners that we know of. There were several other suicides that just don't make any sense. Um, I just assumed that they were also killed during interrogations. And I kept waiting for somebody to say something, but nobody said anything. So I left the CIA in the spring of 2004, and I went into the private sector, and I, I put the CIA behind me, still waiting for somebody to say something. Finally, five and a half years after that initial conversation, in December of 2007, um, a very important, like nationally known reporter for ABC News called me and said that he had a source who said that I had tortured Abu Zubaydah. I said that was absolutely untrue. I was the only person who was kind to Abu Zubaydah. I said, I never laid a hand on him or any other prisoner. Your source is either mistaken or he's a liar. Well, he said, and I didn't know this was an old reporter's trick. You're welcome to come on the show and defend yourself. I said, I'll think about it. In the next couple of days, President Bush gave a press conference. This is George W. Bush. And in that press conference, he said, he looks right in the camera and he said, we do not torture. I knew that was a lie. And I said to my wife, we were sitting on the couch together watching this press conference. And I said, he is looking the American people in the eye and he's lying right to our faces. And then a couple of days later, he's walking from the back of the White House to the helicopter to go to Camp David for the weekend. And a reporter shouted a question about torture. And he turned and he said, well, if there is torture, it's the result of a rogue CIA officer. And I turned to my wife and I said, Brian Ross's source is at the White House and they're gonna try to pin this on me. I said, I'm gonna go public. And so I called Brian Ross and I said, I'll give you your interview. And I decided that no matter what he asked me, 
I was just going to tell the truth. I had waited five and a half years for somebody to say something. Nobody was going to ever say anything. And I thought, well, I will. And so I did. Within 24 hours, the FBI began investigating me. No surprise. But a year later, in December of 2008, they sent my attorneys what's called a declination letter, declining to prosecute me. They said I had not committed a crime. Four weeks later, Barack Obama becomes president, right? Hope and change, right? I believed that lie too for a long time. I had no idea that the Obama administration asked the Justice Department to secretly reopen the case against me. And so for the next three years, my phones were tapped, my emails were being intercepted, and FBI agents were following me everywhere I went. And finally, in January of 2012, I was arrested and charged with five felonies, including three counts of espionage. I hadn't committed espionage. Having a conversation with the New York Times or with the ABC News is not espionage. Um, I was facing 45 years in prison. It's a death sentence. And uh, finally, the government offered me 10 years. I said, I'm not doing 10 minutes. I didn't do anything wrong. They came back a couple days later with eight years. And then two days after that, five years. And my attorney, my lead attorney, I had 11 lawyers, if you can imagine, all charging me $750 an hour. Uh, my lead attorney said, sorry, ah, oh, my daughter. They came down to five years and I rejected it. And my lead attorney said, you know, I've been practicing law here for 53 years and I've never seen them come down in time. And I said, why would they do that? Because usually they'll, they'll offer you 10 years, you say no, they come back with 15 years. If you say no to that, then 20 years. But they kept coming down. I said, why would they do that? And he said, because they have a shit case and they know it's shit. He said, we're going to trial. So that was our position for a very long time. Finally, they came back with three and a half years and we countered with one year and they said no take the three and a half or we're going for the whole 45 and I said I will testify on my own behalf at trial and I may have to talk about some of the hideous crimes against humanity and war crimes that I have witnessed in 15 years in the CIA so they came back and said all right Two and a half, you do 23 months. I actually uh, turned it down, <laughs> crazy as it sounds now. But this is a commentary on the American judicial system. This was best and final offer 23 months. And so my wife and I stayed up all night long, literally all night long, talking about it, researching online, because only one other person had ever been charged with this ever in the history of the country. And there was no case law because she was an actual spy for a foreign intelligence uh, service. So I, I wrote to my lawyers at six o'clock in the morning. I said, I decided to turn it down. And an hour later, two of them emailed me and said, we're on our way to your house. So two of them came over and I said, we were up all night, we discussed it, we're gonna turn it down. I said very foolishly, as soon as I get in front of a jury, they're gonna realize how ridiculous this is. I'm a patriot, I'm not a criminal. And then the lawyer that I liked and respected the most pulled me aside and said, you know what your problem is? Your problem is you think this is about justice and it's not about justice, it's about mitigating damage. Take the deal. And I took the deal. I asked him, realistically, if I go to trial and I lose, what am I looking at? And he said, realistically, 12 to 18 years. So I took the deal. The thing is, one of the techniques, there are two techniques that the government uses. One is called venue shopping, where they will charge you in the federal district where you are most likely to be convicted and most likely to receive the maximum sentence. That's the Eastern District of Virginia because it's right here. And so, and so a jury would be made up of people from the CIA, the FBI, the Pentagon, intelligence community contractors. You don't have a prayer. The other thing is called charge stacking, which they also did to me. Let's say they think they can get you on one charge. They'll charge you with five, 10, 20 felonies. They'll wait until you go bankrupt 
and then they come back and say, all right, if you take a plea to one count, we'll dismiss all the other charges. So what do you do? ProPublica came out with a study in November 2012 in which they found that the federal government wins 98.2% of its cases, almost all of which are a result of plea bargaining because of charge stacking and venue shopping. So if you know you have a 1.8% chance of winning, do you roll the dice and get 18 years? I had five kids, so I took the deal. Mm -hmm. And you were in jail for 23 months. And because I wrote those letters from Loretto, they didn't give me one single day off. Not a single day. Everybody else is getting out early, six months in the halfway house, home confinement. I sat in that cell for every last day of the 23 months. Do you think everyone in their own way should be a whistleblower? Oh, I think everybody should be a whistleblower, or at least consider being a whistleblower. Remember, there's a legal definition of whistleblowing. It's bringing to light any evidence of waste, fraud, abuse, illegality, or threats to the public health or public safety. The government tells us all the time, if you see something, say something. There it is. You created a work. Uh, this desk is fascism. Could you tell me a little bit the story about, about yes, that? Yes, sure. Piece? I'll start off by saying I'm the least artistic person I've ever known. <laughs> I have no artistic ability at all. Mm -hmm. Okay, so anyway, I was in prison, and before I left for prison, my attorney told me that she had a very small mailing list of 600 people who had emailed her during the course of my case saying that they wanted to know how I was doing in prison. So she said, when you get comfortable, send me a letter, I'll type it, and I'll send it to these 600 people. So I said, okay. I was there, I got to prison February 28th, 2013, and then the first week of May, I felt confident enough to sit down and write a letter. Not really thinking that what I was writing was, I was exposing um, wrongdoing on the part of the guards. Mm -hmm. I just thought all guards were assholes. I didn't know they were actually breaking the law by being assholes. <laughs> so I wrote it, and I named their names too. Mm -hmm. I sent it out to my lawyer, and then a couple of nights later, one of the guards came up to me and said, you're famous and not in a good way. And I said, what's that supposed to mean? Mm -hmm. And she took me to the little guard booth and she turned the computer around and there I was, my picture, banner headline on the Huffington Post. I didn't know my lawyer was friends with Ariana Huffington. And so she sent Ariana the, the letter that I called Letter from Loretto and it went crazy from there. CNN, Fox, MSNBC, uh, The Economist, Playboy, The Atlantic Monthly. I got more interview requests than I could handle. And so I decided I'm going to make this a series, right? The guards were so scared at the press reaction. I told a guard one time, don't fuck with me unless you want to see yourself on CNN tomorrow morning. And he backed off and I thought, hey, yeah. I have a little bit of power here. So I called it Letters from Loretto because I wanted to emulate Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail. Mm -hmm. And so I would do a letter whenever one struck me, whenever I saw something I didn't like, whenever I wanted to write about a certain issue, whether it was the food or violence or mm -hmm. whatever. One of the guards committed suicide near the uh, end of my, uh, of my sentence. I wrote about that. Uh, and... Um, and they hated it. And interestingly enough, they thought that I was smuggling them out somehow. One of the guards told me that they had been talking about me in the warden's office and they concluded that I had a secret cell phone hidden somewhere mm -hmm. and I was dictating the letters mm -hmm. on the cell phone. That's how I got them out. Mm -hmm. Well, the truth was I would write them in plain view. I would put them in an envelope and put them in the mailbox. That was it. <laughs> All they had to do was look, yeah. to, look at the mailbox. Yeah. So I wrote something like 16 of them, I think. Mm -hmm. And they became a book called uh, Doing Time Like a Spy, which won a nice literary award here. Mm -hmm. one, one of the big four literary awards, the Penn First Amendment Award. But um, to get to the artwork, 
uh, they were furious that I was writing these letters. And so a friendly guard warned me, they're going to try to take your desk off the wall. And so I paid another prisoner a bag of tuna fish to strip the screws. And sure enough, two hours later, the guards came with the drill and they're trying to drill the desk off the wall and it wouldn't come. Mm -hmm. So they finally walked away and I took a legal pad and I wrote, this desk kills fascism and I stuck it to the desk. And then a couple of hours after that, when they were walking around to count the prisoners that they do five, seven times a day, I forget, mm -hmm. he tore it off and crumpled it up and he threw it at me, which is really what I wanted him to yeah. do. Then I flattened it out and I mailed it back to myself. Oh, okay. And then I, I took a couple of art classes. I found that I actually kind of had a knack for it a little bit. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I made a screen print of the, of the page. I made a hundred copies and I'm selling them to pay my attorneys. Mm -hmm. uh, when were these arenas first given attention by the CIA? And uh, why were they considered so important mm -hmm. in the first place? Yes, the CIA became very interested in art in the early 1950s. Uh, and it was all part of the, the Cold War, mm -hmm. you know, the, the battle between the superpowers. Uh, and, and it's funny. The Russians, we know that the Russians were very worried about abstract art mm -hmm. because they thought that there were messages embedded, political commentaries that were implied. Well, the CIA was kind of the same way. They wanted there to be embedded messages and political commentaries. Mm -hmm. They also respected the Soviets' use of uh, realist art. They call it Soviet realism. And so uh, the CIA began... I don't want to use the word targeting. Maybe I will use the word targeting. Um, artists who specialized in that uh, genre, mm -hmm. right? The Cubans did it, the Eastern Europeans did it, the Russians always did it, the Chinese came to do it a little bit later in the decade. And so, you know, the CIA thought that that was a, a great place to meet uh, nationals of those countries, maybe to infiltrate that world, mm -hmm. to, um, to recruit sources. You know, the mantra at the CIA is that our job is very simple. It's to recruit spies to steal secrets. And that's it. Mm -hmm. That's what we do. Recruit spies to steal secrets. But you have to be inventive and able to do that successfully. Nobody's going to think to recruit a, an artist. Why would you? Well, because artists have access to very important people in society. And so what better way to start? Yeah, yeah. you, you told me just before we, we, we start shooting uh, th th that we, I'd never uh, I'd thought of that. But it's true, during a, a cocktail party, this is the best way <laughs> for just talking. It's the best yeah. way. You, a, a boss of mine in the Counterterrorism Center once paid me a great compliment. We were, I had been developing a very sensitive source. It was, he was so sensitive that we couldn't meet in his country. So every time we needed to meet, I would fly to Europe somewhere and we would meet in a hotel. And his information proved to be perfect every time. And so my boss said, I want to meet him. And so we flew out to Central Europe and um, you know, before you get down to business, you're sitting, talking. And we were talking about art and theater and books and film and whatever. And afterwards, my boss said, you know, he said, I've been a CIA officer for 30 years, and I don't think I've ever seen anybody speak so in depth on so many different issues mm -hmm. as you did today. I said, oh, thank you. I said, you know, I'm actually interested in these issues. I like art and theater and film and books and et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I like it. It's not a job to me. It's uh -huh. fun. Well, that's how this source was. He was, he was very um, wealthy and important and well-connected to the highest levels of people in his government. And he liked me. And really, that's the job. The job is to get you to believe that we are such close friends. You like me so much that you're willing to commit treason for me, mm. which is a death penalty offense. Yeah, yeah. But you do it because you really, really like me. What were the earliest interventions into the realms of art and culture that you may be aware of? 
I'm aware of a program in the 1950s mm -hmm. uh, to cultivate artists within what became known as the Washington Colorist School. Yeah. So um, the CIA actually began collecting art yeah. from artists of the Washington Color School. The art today is worth millions and millions of dollars, and it hangs all over the walls of the hallways of the uh, CIA's new headquarters building. Uh, but the people who created that art were important society figures in Washington in the 1950s. Mm -hmm. They all congregated in Georgetown, for example. Famously, books have been written about this. Well, who did they congregate with? Who did they have dinner with those evenings that they were talking about art? The Russian ambassador, the Chinese ambassador, the French ambassador, whatever visiting dignitaries mm -hmm. happened to be in, famous international businessmen or men of intrigue, right? You know, in J the James Bond movies, the James always runs into the CIA officer. Mm -hmm. That happens every day in real life. Uh -huh. We always see each other and we say, hello, good to yeah. see you. And then you go your way and he goes his way. Yeah. Well, I mean, we're working the same parties. And those parties are full of artists and, and important society figures, especially in the 1950s, when the whole point was communism. Yeah, but I, 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 it seems that still with Russia, it's still a kind of fight, right? It's yeah, not... but it's different. It's far less ideo ideological now, yeah. uh, far less philosophical. Yeah, it's yeah, much more true. pragmatic. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'm that's why, by this. That's why neoliberals are so up in arms about, uh -uh. about Russia right now. The, the Russians are no threat to us. No. None. None whatsoever. And there are a hundred different ways that we should be cooperating with the Russians. Terrorism, drugs, proliferation, poverty, human rights, all different kinds of things. But we don't, right? Because we need an enemy and the Russians are the bad guys. And that's just the way it's always yeah. been. That's awesome. Amaze me. <laughs> What did they hope to achieve through this form of art? Well, actually, the CIA took its lead from, from the Soviet Union uh, when they chose a, uh, abstract art as the vehicle uh, to, to deliver the message. And it was because the Soviets were so worried by abstract art. They didn't understand it. They thought it was perverse in some way. It was somehow a threat to communist ideology. And the CIA thought that was great. That's a... That's a a, um, oh shoot, I'm having a mental blank. Hold on oh, one second. Oh. Let me think of what, what was the word we used to use. That's good. I can move um, one millimeter now. Abstract expressionism? No. Uh, vulnerability. So they, they loved that. To them, that was a vulnerability within the Soviet system. And so they sought to exploit it, which is what they were paid to do. That was their job. Uh, and the more money that they put in, the more they believed they were succeeding. And it wasn't just abstract art back then, too. It was also the translation of classic uh, Russian literature. There was literature, for example, Dostoevsky, that was published well before the, the Bolshevik Revolution that was then banned in the Soviet Union. Well, the CIA would translate it into Russian and then smuggle it into the Soviet Union and just they would hand it out for free. It was the same thing with art. I mean, you can't hand the art out for free, but you can certainly hand out flyers and photos and articles about the art in Russian or Romanian or Bulgarian or whatever. And it was actually a successful uh, operation in that it got under the skin of the, of the Soviet government and they had to react and respond to it. Why abstract art? Because it promotes individualism? You took the word right out of my mouth. Yeah. yeah, abstract art is about individualism, not about collectivism. You know, we're all familiar with that Soviet art of the, the perfect, handsome Russian soldier and the beautiful Russian, female Russian soldier looking off into the sky with the hammer and sickle over here and their rifles. Yeah, it's great, everybody's seen it, everybody knows it. Um, but abstract expressionism was confusing to them. It was decadent, it was dangerous, it was very American, and, uh, and they weren't sure how to uh, deal with it. Mm. There's also a, 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 a ahistoricism to the form of abstract art. There's, a, there's, a, there's, so almost, true. A, there's almost a deliberateness in its lack of concrete meaning, in a way. So uh, true, so uh, true. I, I worked for an ambassador in Bahrain for two years, and he was a great, great fan of abstract expressionism. And he had quite a large piece um, 
installed in the in the official residence we have a program here in the United States called the art and embassies program and so through the State Department's Office of Artistic Affairs any ambassador anywhere in the world can request a piece of art from the Smithsonian Institution real art right worth millions upon millions of dollars this piece of art that he had was so ugly that I I, I hated even to look at it. And for whatever reason, he knew I subscribed to Art News Magazine at the time. So he would always seat me at the dining room table so that I had a view of the art right in front of my face. And it was awful. It was just these four panels, I'll never forget it, painted gold. And then there was a red splotch down here on the first one, in the middle on the second one, at the top on the third one, and back at the bottom again in the fourth one. And it meant nothing to me. One night, the, uh, the king came to dinner, right? So we had this big bash. It was two dozen people and his majesty's at one side and the ambassador's at the other side and we're all sitting there, you know, afraid to say anything. And the ambassador said, how do you like my, my art? It's abstract expressionism. And the king said, David, he said, I hate it. I hate it. He said, it's ugly and it means nothing to me. Now, I had been looking at this thing for two years. It meant nothing to me. And he said, no, your majesty. He said, it's the day. It's sunrise, midday, evening, and midnight. And I thought to myself, how in the world do you get that out of this ugly gold and red panel? But then, you know, after thinking about it, he was, he was right. Now, it was funny to us that the king thought it was ugly and the ambassador thought it was great. But imagine being Joseph Stalin, looking at it and thinking, there's a message in there somewhere and I don't like it one bit. And I know there's a message because the Americans are putting this thing all over the place. So it was an effective propaganda tool. I wonder if the CIA still uses cultural propaganda. The CIA doesn't have to use cultural propaganda anymore. Uh, Hollywood does it for them. And certainly there are connections between the CIA and Hollywood studios. There, there always have been. Not just the CIA, but also the FBI. You know, there were no FBI shows on American television that weren't made without the cooperation of J. Edgar Hoover's FBI. And so every show on American TV that mentioned the FBI was a pro-FBI show. Well, the CIA's Office of Public Affairs has a branch embedded within it here at CIA headquarters whose job it is solely to work with, with Hollywood film studios. So every depiction of the CIA is a positive depiction. So, you know, these big blockbuster movies that are made and that go overseas that are frequently banned in China, for example, they're all cleared by the CIA. Look at the film Zero Dark Thirty, for example. This is kind of an egregious example of this issue. Uh, Catherine Bigelow was the director and producer. Mark Bull was the writer. They're both Academy Award winners. Very important figures in Hollywood. Well, they wanted to do Zero Dark Thirty. Now, Zero Dark Thirty, I thought, was scandalous because it perpetuated a lie. And the lie was that the torture program led to the location of Osama bin Laden. That was a lie. The torture program had nothing whatsoever to do with the location of Osama bin Laden. Really great analysis is what caught Osama bin Laden. But Bigelow and Bull were invited to come to CIA headquarters where they were treated to a classified briefing that took place over a classified mock-up of the bin Laden compound. That's a violation of the Espionage Act. After that was done and bin Laden was, was uh, killed, uh, they were invited back to hear a speech by then CIA Director Leon Panetta in the bubble that I talked about earlier, that, that big theater uh, just outside the original headquarters building. And in the speech, Leon Panetta revealed classified information, 120 lines of classified information we now know, including the classified name of the Navy SEAL who actually killed bin Laden. That's also a violation of the Espionage Act. But what did Catherine Bigelow and Mark Bull do? They went back to Hollywood. They made this CIA propaganda film. It went all around the world. It made hundreds of millions of dollars at the box office. And now you have people really believing that the CIA's torture program resulted in the capture of Osama bin Laden. That's what we need to be more fearful of. Now it's not 
placing abstract art in museum shows around the world. It's this active propagandization of not just the American people, but the rest of the world. Mm. I've been told that yourself work for the CIA as an advisor. Right, for one year. For one year. Yeah. Yes. Could you tell me about that? Uh, I did it as, uh, I did it on a lark. Uh, so there was a, there's an employee database where they, they post notices like uh, this section of the parking lot is going to be closed for repaving or this entrance is closed because the president's coming or things like that, just normal administrative things. And one day there was a memo saying that there is a vacancy on the CIA art advisory board. I didn't even know there was a CIA art advisory board, although I did admire the art for you know the six years previous that I had been at the CIA. And so um, I applied and I said, I know a little bit about art. I have three Andy Warhols, as you can see around here, and, and I have a Fernando Botero, and you know, they're not posters. They're all signed and numbered lithographs and such. I, I love this stuff. I've got some prominent Greek artists, um, Art is important to me, and uh, and sure enough, I was appointed, and I I thought that it was going to be you know art acquisition or conservation or whatever, and it wasn't. Uh, we met four times, and all we ever discussed is what to hang where. Uh, they were in the process of of building a new CIA museum on the on the first floor of the new headquarters building. And so we had to move the art out of that area during construction and put it in different halls and it was underwhelming. Mm. But it was important to me that that there be art at the CIA. If you go to the White House, if you go, like I said earlier, to American embassies around the world that participate in the Art and Embassies program, there's world-class art. Uh, and it's there for anybody who wants to look at it. And I thought the CIA should have great art too. Could you please explain to us the concept of soft power? Yeah. Soft power is critically important, especially when you want to be the one and only superpower in the world. Um, you've heard the phrase, uh, the carrot and the stick. Soft power really is the carrot in a way. Uh, it's not a threat of, uh, of a bombing strike or a drone attack or um, sanctions at the United Nations. It's the influence of American culture. It's the, the propagation of American ideas or ideals just because we're bigger and stronger and more popular than you are. And so it's become a very important part of American foreign policy, but especially since the end of the Vietnam War. Uh, and it's because also the world has gotten so much smaller with the internet and streaming services, for example. It's much easier for somebody in Siberia to log on to Netflix, for example, and watch you know, American Westerns, or, or for somebody in Cuba to watch every season of Friends, let's say. Well, that has propaganda value in that you come to identify with the things that you're watching. Uh, you know, there's kind of a famous story that in the late 1980s, when there were pro-democracy riots taking place in Seoul, South Korea, the North Koreans capitalized on this by, by showing real footage, news footage of the demonstrations on North Korean television. Well, North Koreans were speechless when they saw it, not because there were demonstrations or riots. They couldn't believe how well dressed everybody was, how well fed they were, what beautiful cars they were driving. And it, it backfired on the North Koreans. That's kind of a reverse example of what soft power is. We can say, look at our great movies. You know, wouldn't you like to be like us? You can be like us. You just have to love us and respect us. And that actually works. What were the concern of the CIA when you left? When I left, it was all about terrorism. I'll give you, I'll give you a, a small anecdote. Um, in the couple of weeks after the 9-11 attacks, everybody in the building had to drop whatever he or she was doing and focus on terrorism. Uh, 
Well, I was already focused on terrorism. I was in the CIA's counterterrorism office and I had um, been recently promoted. So I went up to Ambassador Kofor Black, the head of counterterrorism, with an idea. I said, Kofor, I have an idea for an operation I want to pass by you. He put up his hands. He said, whatever it is, just do it. I have so much money, I can't possibly spend it all. And that was it. And that wasn't just me because he liked me. That was anybody. Just do it. Everybody in the building was coming up with ideas for operations against terrorism. Is the CIA still actively involved today in promoting works of art? Yes, the, the CIA as an organization is very involved in promoting these kinds of works, even though they're not necessarily made by the CIA. This isn't some kind of a clandestine program, let's say, to make a movie or make a documentary and try to get it distributed. They don't waste their time doing things like that. They have such good, close relations with Hollywood studios. I wonder, what is the ideology of the CIA? The ideology is, is nationalism. It's as simple as that. Because if you are an American nationalist, let's say an American exceptionalist, everything else is going to fall into line. It's that easy. Do you have any knowledge on how the art market fits into the global financial yes. system? Um, I'm, t I'm told uh, by, by people with first-hand experience, whether it's at the FBI or the Treasury Department, that uh, the only two ways that you can launder money these days, you know, in, in this era of everything being um, electronically recorded, uh, is through art and real estate. Uh, real estate's a little bit tougher. You set up an LLC, maybe the LLC is based in the Isle of Man or in Liechtenstein or the Caymans or whatever. But there's no record of who buys and sells art anywhere. And so there's no record of whether or not art is bought and sold with cash. Uh, what art dealer, what art gallerist wouldn't want to sell a million dollar piece, even if it's in cash, and then he or she has to worry about how to launder the cash? That's what they do. And so this is a problem that I know that the FBI has been facing for a long time. I had a conversation about this in 2002 or 2003, that they just couldn't get a handle on transactions that were taking place in the art uh, community. Thank you. I have now some general questions, John. Uh, do you think there is such a thing as truth and justice in art? In the past, I would have told you no. Uh, today I'm going to tell you yes, and, I, and I'll tell you why. Um, so I've become acquainted with Ai Weiwei, the Chinese activist and artist. What a, what a good and decent man this guy is. Uh, six weeks before the end of my prison sentence, I started receiving these postcards in the mail. They were just simple postcards, blank on one side, and on the other side it was a photograph of an eagle soaring through the air. And on the other side, there might be a picture drawn or a heart or you are not forgotten or something. Most of them were unsigned. And um, finally another prisoner came up to me and said, hey buddy, you're in a magazine. Uh, it was the, the Week, it's a competitor of Time magazine. I didn't know I was in this magazine, but it was an article about an exhibit that Weiwei had created that had been placed at Alcatraz, the notorious prison in San Francisco Bay. And what he did was he, he took photographs of 189 political prisoners or prisoners of conscience from around the world, from 23 different countries. And he made portraits out of Legos. And the portraits appeared all over the floor throughout Alcatraz. And then in individual cells, especially in solitary confinement. There were other installations, ceramic flowers, for example, thousands of ceramic flowers. I have one upstairs that he gave me. And um, the reason he did this was twofold. One, when he was five years old, his father was arrested by Chinese authorities uh, and charged with espionage for writing a poem that one interpretation was advocated democracy. So the entire family, after his father was arrested, the entire family was forced to move to far northeastern China, sort of the Chinese version of, of Siberia. And he was interned in a camp there. So one day, someone sent him a postcard and said, you are not forgotten. And it so improved his morale 
that it led him to begin writing poetry again, even though he was being held uh, in this prison camp. And Weiwei always said that his father talked about it through his life, about what that postcard meant to him, because he really did think he was forgotten. I can tell you, I, you know, I always worried that I was forgotten. You know, you're inside, you're in prison, your life comes to a complete standstill. But the real world keeps moving on outside. You know, my best friend in prison, um, his sentence was commuted by President Obama and he was released, but he had been in for 17 years. He had never seen a cell phone before, let alone an ATM machine or use the internet or anything. So you come to a stop. The world keeps moving. And I ended up receiving well over 2,000 of these postcards. And then the day that I got out of prison was the last day of the exhibit. And Weiwei's gallerist walked around with an iPad and showed me the whole, the whole thing. Well, that was 2015. And we're still talking about it now at the end of 2019 because that exhibit went everywhere. And it was purchased by the Smithsonian Institution. As crazy as it sounds, our portraits, portraits now are all hanging in the Smithsonian Institution, in the Hirshhorn Gallery of Art. Uh, and there's a documentary that's been made about the conceptualization and the development and finally the installation of this program. Uh, the response from Europe is far, far greater than the response from the United States. And I've always said this, that the Europeans are light years ahead of the United States in terms of respect for human rights and civil rights and civil liberties and transparency. Not the Brits. The Brits are just like we are. But everybody else is far ahead. And so if I think outside the United States, yes, I think truth and justice and transparency and freedom will eventually prevail. It'll take us longer here.